So welcome to the last of the regular sessions as opposed to the lightning fast reviews that I'm going to be doing and sending out details hopefully tonight by email when I get home if I remember and I'm still awake after this. Here is my plan. I'm going to do everything that's left until I run out of time. All right. So I may not take too many questions until the end. I apologize. If there's something really burning, just, just say so. Anyway, by way of a little bit of review, last time we saw the rather impressive, if you hopefully appreciate it, spectral theorem, which says that if A is symmetric, So it has to be symmetric, so it's obviously got to be square. Then A is not only diagonalizable, that's the standard sort of diagonalizable. We're changing basis so that everything is an eigenvalue, eigen, every vector is an eigenvector, at least the standard basis vectors become eigenvectors, is really what I mean, mean to say. But not only that, S is orthogonal. So that means S inverse is S transpose. So you could replace that S inverse by S transpose. So what that means is essentially symmetric matrices have some eigenbasis, which is orthonormal. So if you prefer, alternatively, A has an orthonormal O slash N eigenbasis. So you can find three vectors which are perpendicular to each other, say if this is three by three, of length one that are all eigenvectors. And that is exactly encapsulated in that formula. So there's a theorem. An example of a problem would be this. And we'll spend a little time on this because I, I didn't do any examples last time. After I do this, I'm going to move on to the next section on quadratic forms. But I'm giving you a 3 by 3 matrix, A. And this one doesn't come from the book that I can see. I kind of made it up. OK. And you observe that A is symmetric. The diagonals are fine. But this 2 and this 2 have to match minus 2, minus 2, 1, 1. So it's a symmetric 3 by 3 matrix. And the task is to find an orthonormal eigenbasis, or in fact, Let's try to write A equals S, D, S inverse. So the aim is to find the S and the D that make this the case. Now, there's not just going to be one correct answer. For example, you can permute the entries of D if they're different, and then the columns of S will also permute in the same way. So it's not saying there's only one way of doing this, but my question is find S and D that make this true. S orthogonal, D diagonal to make that equation true. So that's the question. All right. The way we do this is very similar to the way we would normally try to find an eigenbasis for A, as in diagonalize. But we have to be a little more careful in, in order to get the orthonormal basis. So let's just see what's going on here. So the first thing we want to do is find the eigenvalues of A. So you take debt. So here's the eigenvalues. Take debt. A minus lambda i, 3 if you like. So this is the determinant of this 3 by 3 matrix. Minus 1 minus lambda, 2 minus 2, 2, 2 minus lambda, 1 minus 2, 1, 2 minus lambda. And there's no zeros. There's no particularly nice way of doing it. I'm just going to do the standard expansion across the top row. So you get minus 1 minus lambda times the determinant of a sub 2 by 2 matrix, 2 minus lambda, all squared, minus 1, minus 2 times, I know this is going to be nightmare for the camera work, but you know this is just a determinant. We know how to do this by now. I should even just tell you what the answer is, but I don't remember it. Just going to have to work it out. And then finally, the last term, there's a minus 2. 2 times 1 plus 2 times 2 minus lambda. Not very illuminating. Minus 1 minus lambda. Let's just expand this. You get lambda squared minus 4 lambda plus 4 minus 3. 
Okay, what do we get here? We get four, another, uh, uh, four plus two is six. That's two, lots of six minus two lambda. And this other one is actually another lot of two, and this works out to be four plus two is six minus two lambda again. Now before you go and expand everything into a cubic and then try to factor it, maybe we get lucky and there's some nice factoring that we can already do. We could write this as, well, let's keep it as minus one minus lambda. What's this? This is lambda minus three, lambda minus one. And the reason this is nice is we consolidate this into minus eight, three minus lambda. Right, there's two lots of three minus lambda there times two, and another two times two, and that gives us eight. So we've actually got a lambda minus three if, we're, if we multiply all this out. You have a lambda minus three. Uh, this is lambda plus one times lambda minus one, except with the minus. So it's going to be one minus lambda squared, and then um, the lambda minus three gives us a plus eight. So I'm just doing some fancy algebraic trickery, but any way you look at it, you get lambda minus 3, and then 9 minus lambda is 3 minus lambda, 3 plus lambda. And regardless of whether you choose to write this as, as uh, lambda minus 3, lambda, it, it doesn't really matter because the zeros are 3 or minus 3. And this is algebraic multiplicity 2. And this is multiplicity 1. There's two factors of lambda minus 3. Okay, what's the geometric multiplicity of this eigenvalue here without knowing anything else than what you've seen? Can anyone just tell me what the geometric multiplicity must be? It must be 2. In general, if I told you a 3 by 3 matrix has two eigenvalues, 3 and minus 3, algebraic multiplicity 2 and 1 respectively, you can't say anything about the geometric multiplicity of this one other than that it's 1 or 2, but you can't say what it is. But because the original matrix is symmetric, the spectral theorem tells us immediately that it is diagonalizable. And if a matrix is diagonalizable, then the geometric multiplicity of every eigenvalue must equal its algebraic multiplicity because you have a complete eigenbasis. Okay, so you might want to write down that fact. A diagonalizable matrix has geom geometric multiplicity of every eigenvalue equal to the algebraic multiplicity, and the spectral theorem says, in particular, it says more, but it says that symmetric matrices are automatically diagonalizable. So that's a bit to chew on. While you're chewing on that and writing it down, I'm going to proceed. Uh, we need to find the eigenvalues, uh, the eigenvectors rather. So what I'm going to do is find the eigenvectors. So first, lambda equals 3. Now you have to look at the kernel of a minus 3i, which is the kernel of this matrix over here with lambda equals 3. And you get minus 4, 2, minus 2. 2, minus 1, 1, minus 2, 1, minus 1. And if you stare at this, you will see that actually all three rows are multiples of the middle one. So by, by doing an elimination, I mean, you can divide the top one by minus 2 and then subtract the top, that one from the top from that one and add the top to that one. And you see this is the same as the kernel of just 2, minus 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So that's the span of, well, if you have a 1 in this position, then you could have a 2 there. So 1, 2, 0 is going to work. Or if you had a 1 in that position, you could have a minus 2 there. Is that what I want to use? No. Another way of noticing it is that with this minus 1 and 1 there, you could have 0, 1, 1. There's many different representations. I just choose to notice that that plus that is zero. So certainly that is just the kernel. It's a two-dimensional space, so the geometric multiplicity is indeed two. All right, now we have to repeat for lambda equals minus three. 
and you take the kernel of A plus 3i this time, take the original matrix and add, uh, take lambda is negative 3, and you get 2, 2, minus 2, 2, uh, lambda is minus 3, so this is 5, 1, and minus 1, no, minus 2, 1, 5, I believe. All right, and it is not difficult to see that you get the answer 2 minus 1, 1, or some multiple thereof. Okay, you could check that mentally, just multiply this out and you'll see you get zero. All right, so if we were not trying to find an orthogonal S, we are already entitled to write that A is, I'll call it S tilde D, S tilde inverse. We can already write that. S tilde is the matrix whose columns are the eigenvectors 1, 2, 0, 0, 1, 1, and the other eigenvector 2, minus 1, 1. And D is the diagonal matrix whose entries correspond to the eigenvalues in the correct order. So since I've put two vectors that belong to the three-dimensional, uh, sorry, the lambda equals three space first, I've got to put the threes there. And then this is the minus three one, so I put that there. That's a true statement, but it does not answer the question because S is not orthogonal. We've diagonalized it, and that's certainly true, but S tilde is not orthogonal. That's why I didn't just call it S. I'm not giving it that honor. Instead, I notice it can't be orthogonal because the columns do not form an orthonormal basis. So what is left is that we must turn the columns theorem is it says that the eigenspaces themselves are orthogonal. So here is a minus 3, and these two are part of the same space of 3. So this one should automatically be orthogonal to these two vectors. Are they? Is it? 1, 2, mi two minus 2. Yes. How about this one? Yes. All right. So there's no work to be done there. Unfortunately, we're going to have to do Gram-Schmidt on here. We need to find an orthonormal basis. So you need Gram-Schmidt on the eigenspace with 3. So we have our two vectors. This is v1, and that is v2. And we need to do ye old gram schmitty. Why don't we have to do it on the other one? Well, you actually do have to do it on the other one. The question is, why do you not do gram schmidt on the other one? The answer is you do, except with only one vector, it just consists of dividing by the norm of it. You treat every eigenspace independently. You do Gram-Schmidt on each of them. In this case, there's two of them, and this one is very, very straightforward. But anyway, to do the Gram-Schmidt, what we do is we have v1 is 1, 2, 0. Um, so immediately, u1 is 1 over root 5, 1, 2, 0. Because I don't know why I'm using square brackets. It doesn't matter round brackets, square brackets, the length of this is root 5. Um, v2 perp is v1 minus v1 dot u1 u1. That's the, that, uh, I'm sorry, v2 here. Perp is v2 minus v2 dot u1 u1, which is equal to, let's do it over here, v2 is 0, 1, 1. Then we have to subtract 0, 1, 1, dot 1 over root 5, 1, 2, 0. That's our u1. That scalar times 1 over root 5, 1, 2, 0. And the 1 over root 5 has become a fifth. This quantity is just 2. So this would be 0, 1, 1, minus 2 fifths, lots of 1, 2, 0. Which works with about the minus two fifths, one fifth, one. And then finally, U2 is supposed to be the normalization of this. 
and you can cheat because, see, you can immediately say, ah, look, that vector is just the same as minus 2, 1, 5 times a constant, and the length of this is 4 plus 1, 25 is 30. So actually, you could write u2 as 1 over root 30 times this vector. You see, there's no point, oops, there's no point in normalizing a messy vector like that. You can just normalize any multiple of it. You still get the same answer. So that's a little trick there. Just multiply the coordinates by 5 to get a, a multiple, and then stretch that multiple. You still have a unit vector here. And then that should be orthogonal to that. And it is. And also, these two should span uh, the space. And if we've done it correctly, then they do. Anyway, so we're going to use these vectors instead in our matrix. And that takes care of the three eigenspace. As for the, the minus three eigenspace, well, we, we could do Gram-Schmidt on it, and we, in fact, have to. There's only one vector, and all we end up doing is writing down that v1, well, let's say v3, is 2, 1, 2, minus 1, 1. This is for the minus 3 eigenspace, only one vector. There's a bit of a numbering problem because we, you're supposed to start at 1. I'm starting at 3 because I already have 1 and 2, but hopefully we can take into account that. And you get 1 sixth times 2 minus 1, 1. All right, so what? We've replaced our original collection v1, v2, v3 with a new collection u1, u2, and u3, which is just that normalized. But that is exactly what we need. So our true matrix X has the columns in order U1, which I now have to look up. It's 1 over root 5, 2 over root 5, 0. And then the other messy vector that we found, minus 2 over root 30, uh, 1 over root 30, 5 over root 30. And then finally, this u3 that we found, 2 over root 6, minus 1 over root 6, and 1 over root 6. Yikes. The good news is that the D matrix is the same as it was before. 3, 3, minus 3. Same eigenvalues. All we've done is just pick a different basis for the two eigenspaces. This is still the same eigenspace, and that's still the same eigenspace as it was before. We just chose different representative vectors to make this matrix orthogonal. And it is orthogonal. If you actually do the dot product of any two of these rows, you will get 0 here because the 1 minus 2, 2, 1. Same for this pair. And as for this pair, you have minus 2 gives you minus 4 from there. Minus 1 from there is minus 5 plus 5. So it's 0. And then all these root 5s and root 30s and root 6s are just normalizing each column. OK, so the point is that the spectral theorem guarantees that you can do this. If the matrix is not symmetric, you cannot do this. So the spectral theorem actually says symmetric matrices are precisely the uh, matrices for which this trick works. All right? So that's a lightning fast, 20 minute long example of a, the spectral theorem in action. And notice that the only difference, again, between that and the regular diagonalizer matrix is that you have to do the Gram-Schmidt step at the end to orthogonalize. Now, if you are lucky, you get three different eigenvalues. In that case, all you have to do is divide each column by the norms because the eigenvectors will automatically be linearly independent. There'll be three, say, one-dimensional eigenspaces, and they'll automatically be orthogonal, ortho that you just have to make them orthonormal. All right, but if unluckily you get a two-dimensional eigenspace, you are going to have to do the full Gram-Schmidt. Question. Uh, that's the eigenvalue of uh, three. Yes. Why couldn't one of the eigenvectors be one, one, or one minus one, one? The question is, why couldn't one of the eigenvalues, eigenvectors be one minus one, well, let's say 1, 1, minus 1. Of course it could be. There's no unique choice for this. 
And so there's definitely no unique choice for the diagonalization. And second, there's not a unique orthonormal basis. The point is that actually any S where the first two columns are an orthonormal basis for this, and the third column is either as it is or the negative of it, because there's only, there's only a choice of two, any, any of that will, will still work. It's quite nice. It's sort of surprising. But, but there's, it's definitely not a unique choice. And given a two-dimensional space, there's infinitely many orthonormal bases you can choose. You just sort of rotate them around. OK. Yep, you choose any two vectors in the kernel, you'll get a different answer. But it will still be acceptable if it's, if it's a basis. And so maybe they won't ask this sort of question because it's too hard to grade. You actually have to check that the, that the basis is correct. All right, any other questions before I move on to quadratic forms? All right. Quadratic forms. That's section 8.2. All right, so what are we dealing with here? Let's define a function as follows. Q of x is x transpose, so that's a row vector now, a x. All right, so a here is going to be a symmetric matrix. Symmetric n by n. We've just been talking about symmetric matrices, so we might as well see an application. And x is a vector in Rn. So this is actually a real number because this is n by 1, or 1 by n rather, times n by n times n by 1. So this is a 1 by 1 matrix. It's just a real number, actually, in the end. So 1 by 1, i.e. a real number. Interesting. Suppose A is the identity, interesting case. So pretend that it's just x transpose x. How would you describe? So if A is the identity, which is certainly symmetric, Q of x is x transpose x. How would you describe that? Anyone know what that is? Yes, this is the same as x dot x, otherwise known as the length of x squared. It's a really lousy error. All right. So the length of x squared is an example of a quadratic form. Now, if I wrote this out in full, this would be x1 squared plus x2 squared and so on up to xn squared. And you can see that those are actually all quadratic terms. So this is just a regular old quadratic in n dimensions or in n variables. Now, what if A is a little bit more interesting? Suppose we take, suppose we take our previous A, so we just work out what if A is minus one, minus one, two, minus two, 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 one, minus two, one, two from before, then Q of X equals X transpose a x, which is, say, x1, x2, x3, times this symmetric matrix. And soon we'll see why it's so nice that the matrix is symmetric. So it remains to multiply this out. And if you do so, I can tell you what you're going to get. So what I want to do is show you how you can see what you're going to get, and then you have to just check it later. So what you're going to get is the diagonals are going to give you the pure terms. So x1 corresponds to the minus 1. So it's minus x1 squared, the pure quadratic terms. So minus x1 squared, 2x2 squared, and 2x3 squared. Try it and see. some terms as well. And again, you have to try it for yourself. But what you're going to get is that this is in the 1, 2 position and the 2, 1 position. They're the same. So I'm going to add those up for lots of x1, x2. It's possible. I wrote x1, x1, x2. I wrote x1, x1, x2. I wrote x1, x1, x2. Oh, yes, this is definitely a mistake. 
Thank you. Yes, this is supposed to be one, two, three. Thank you for spotting that. So anyway, I add those two up. Now, as for this one and this one, I add those two up. Of course, that's the same as doubling one of them because they're the same. And I get minus 4x1, x3. Why x1, x3? Because this is in the 1, 3 position. And then finally, if I add those two up, that's the 2, 3 position. I will get 2, x2, x3. And the best way to see it is to just try to do it for yourself. Now, of course, we can actually reverse engineer it. And you can take any quadratic form. So I'm going to say a quadratic form, then, is either defined like that or defined like this. A quadratic form is a function, is a basically a homogeneous degree 2 polynomial. Homogeneous degree 2 polynomial. That's all it is in n variables. So you have n variables. Degree 2 means that every term would have to be at most a quadratic, but homogeneous means that every term is exactly a quadratic. So it's either the square of one of the variables or the product of two of the variables. In fact, if you think of this as x1 times x1, it's just the product of two of the variables with a coefficient and a linear combination thereof, i.e. a homogeneous degree 2 polynomial. So the question is, how do you reverse engineer it? Well, you basically halve the coefficients that aren't the uh, pure ones. So for example, so in reverse, if you have the quadratic form x1 squared, I'll do three variables still. Uh, if you have x1 squared minus 4x3 squared plus 2x1x3 x x minus 5x2x3, then you can automatically write down the corresponding matrix. So this equals x transpose ax, where a is the symmetric matrix. And now watch carefully. x1 squared has a coefficient of 1. x2 squared has a coefficient of 0. x3 squared has a coefficient of minus 4. What about the off diagonals? There's no x1, x2. So I'll put a 0, 0. x1, x3 has a 2, but I have to halve that and put a 1 there and a 1 there. So I sort of symmetrically distribute it. And then x2, x3 has a minus 5. So I halve that and put a minus 5 halves and a minus 5 halves. You always end up with a symmetric matrix if you do that. All right, so is everyone clear on the algorithm needed? And of course, again, I urge you to actually multiply x1, x2, x3 x1, x2, x3 with that matrix and see that you do get that quantity. It's really good to see it. If you, once you see it, you'll see exactly how it works. All right, so what is the connection between this and the previous section? Well, symmetric matrices are diagonalizable. So what? Well, if instead of a symmetric matrix, you take a diagonal matrix, then the quadratic form only has the pure terms, the squares. So if, where am I? If A is diagonal, then Q of X, Let's say A is diagonal like this, lambda 1, lambda 2, up to lambda n, with zeros everywhere else. Then Q of x is just lambda 1, x1 squared, plus lambda 2, x2 squared, plus lambda n, xn squared. So it sort of has the square complete. The, the, the square is completed. You've completed the square. This is beautiful. There's no cross terms. It's extremely easy to graph something like that. In fact, it's going to look like some sort of ellipsoid or hyperboloid, and we'll look at some actual geometry of that soon. But the, the point I want to make is this is nice. That's my point. That's a technical term. Now, that could be a little bit too much to hope for. A is not necessarily diagonal, but on the other hand, it's diagonalizable. So what is the implication for this? Well, the beauty of the situation is this. Say x, 
Well, first of all, let's say this. Write A as S, D, S inverse, where S is orthogonal and D diagonal as always. And that's the spectral theorem that says we can do it. That guarantees that we can do it. Okay, A is symmetric. So we write it like that. So we think of this as a change of basis. Now, the deal is this. If x in the basis b, and I'll say what this is in just a second. All right. If x in the basis b is this, so the basis b, this is the basis with the columns of s. Okay, remember, geometrically, what we've done in diagonalizing A is change the basis. The columns of S are the new basis, as in the example up here. Think of these columns as an orthonormal basis. And what we want to do is write X in terms of that basis. So this means that X is equal to C1, V1 plus C2, V2, and so on, up to Cn, Vn. If that's the case, then you can go through, whoops, very easily, and chase through all the equations, and you can see that Q of X is equal to X transpose A, X, which is X transpose S, A, S inverse, I'm sorry, S, D, S inverse, X, because A is indeed S, D, S inverse. But S inverse is the same as S transpose. So actually, the transpose, and so, or if you prefer, you can keep it as an inverse, whatever. What you will find, actually, let's keep it as an inverse. What you will find is that you actually get S inverse X transpose D S inverse X. And that is because S inverse transpose is just S. And by definition, this is C transpose D C, because the S inverse is the change of basis matrix. So the point is, this is just lambda 1 C1 squared up to lambda n cn squared. OK, so that's a whole lot of math symbols, blah, blah, blah. What does it mean? What it means is this. If you want to understand what is going on with this quadratic form in general and make it simpler, given an x, rather than compute it as an ugly expression like this, for example, what you really want to do is instead take the x change the basis and find out what these magic numbers C are, and then use this expression instead. So instead of computing that, as I said, you could just find the C's and then compute this. So you need to know the V's and the lambdas, of course, but then everything is much, straight, much more straightforward. All right. I'm going to come back to this example in a few minutes, so I'll leave that up there. But let's try to get a little more concrete in a two-dimensional case. Before we do that, I need just a couple more definitions. A couple more definitions. So definitions go like this. If Q of X is always positive, for all x except for 0. Uh, whenever you substitute 0, of course, since it's x transpose ax, it's going to be 0. But if that's true, q is called positive definite. So positive definite means no matter what you plug in, if it's non-zero, you get a positive answer. An example is, for example, uh, is when A is the identity. 
and you just get the norm of x squared, the length of x squared. Well, of course, that's positive unless x is 0. Now, this fact here, this is true no matter what. What it's saying is there's always a change of basis that makes q of x into just the combination of this. So look at this expression. It's lambda 1 c 1 squared plus etc. up to lambda n c n squared. These are all positive. So if the lambda n, if all the lambdas are positive, then this expression has to be positive. Unless, of course, all the c's are 0, in which case x is 0. If any one of these lambdas is negative, though, then this quantity could be negative. You just set all the other c's to 0 and concentrate on that lambda that makes it negative. So basically, if any of these lambdas are negative, or even 0, then you can make q of x not positive. If one of them is 0, you can make it 0. So basically, this will only happen, this is exactly or precisely when all the eigenvalues of A are positive. If any of them are negative, then you can thwart this by choosing x correctly so that the c's that it comes up with give you a negative number. You say it's positive semi-definite. So it's sort of almost definite, but unfortunately there are some x's that give you a zero. At least there's nothing that gives you a negative. And this is when all eigenvalues of a are greater than or equal to zero. So if you have some zero eigenvalues, as in a kernel, of the underlying symmetric matrix, then, but all the other ones are, all the non-zero eigenvalues are positive, you get a semi-definite matrix. And of course, there's similar definitions for negative and negative semi-definite. There you'd need all the eigenvalues to be negative or non-positive, respectively. So similarly, for negative definite, and negative semi-definite. I'm not going to bother writing the definitions down. And then finally, indefinite. None of the above. <laughs> and in practice, some eigenvalues are positive, some lambda i's positive, some negative. Mixed sign. So in the example of the symmetric matrix we looked at for the first 20 minutes of the class, there were two eigenvalues of 3 and one of minus 3. So it's indefinite. That example is indefinite because you have two positive and one negative eigenvalue. So it's not definite. It's not even semi-definite. All right? Any questions about those definitions specifically? All right. So I just want you to understand that Q is in principle a function. It takes a vector and gives you back a number. Okay? So the eigenvalues come from the fact that Q is a special function and gives rise to a symmetric matrix. It sort of it just has it, even though it's not in there, you, you have to kind of write it down, but it's there. It's sitting there and hidden, and the eigenvalues of it can be found. And they're all real because symmetric matrices have real eigenvalues. And then you can sort of look at the all positive or all negative. Some of them are zero, some of them are both. And then you can classify this just by looking at the eigenvalues. So we found the symmetry in the situation. All right. So moving right along, let's look at the geometry of the situation. I want to spend some time on the two-dimensional case. Two dimensions. All right. <clears throat> so first of all, you start with the diagonal case, and you see what you get. So the diagonal case, the matrix would look like this. Just two eigenvalues, 
lambda 1, lambda 2, and we generally assume that lambda 1 is bigger than lambda 2. If not, you can always just flip it around bigger than or equal to lambda 2. Assume this, or label them so that this is the case. So we've decided we can always flip these things around. You just relabel the variables, not a big deal. All right, so what you get is the quadratic form q, and instead of x, I'll use the coordinate c. So q of c is lambda 1 c1 squared plus lambda 2 c2 squared. Very simple function. And if the c1 and c2 confuses you, think of this as lambda 1 x1 x squared plus lambda 2 y squared. It's just, just like an ellipse or something like that. Well, is it an ellipse? Probably. Depends on what the sign is. Okay, so let's just take a look at this. What we want to do is plot the level set q of c equals 1 in the c1, c2 plane. That's what we want to plot. Okay, so case 1, if lambda 1 and lambda 2 are both positive, then this is just an ellipse. You have lambda 1, c1 squared, plus lambda 2, c2 squared is 1. So this is an ellipse like this. And that wasn't very well drawn, but it will do. You get 1 over root lambda 1 here, and 1 over root lambda 2 here. Actually, I didn't draw this. Let, let me just redraw this. I assume lambda 1 is bigger than lambda 2, although I didn't really need to. But that means that 1 over lambda 1 is actually smaller. So it's probably should be drawn like this. So this is 1 over root lambda 1. This is 1 over root lambda 2. And this is the C1 axis. And this is the C2 axis. And if you look at it, you'll see, yes, that's exactly the correct picture. And of course, if you specialize it to a particular case, you need to know what the lambda 1 and lambda 2 are. So, on the other hand, let us consider the case where, say, one of them is negative. If lambda 1 is positive, but lambda 2 is negative, then this looks like lambda, this equation here, this is really like a minus here. So what you'll find is you get a hyperbola. You get a hyperbola. And this is 1 over root lambda 1 as before. And this is minus 1 over root lambda 1. So where does lambda 2 come into it? This is a graph of lambda 1 c1 squared plus lambda 2 c2 squared equals 1. But remember, this is negative. So think of it as minus something instead. Um, so actually, lambda 2 comes in. This is supposed to be asymptotic to this. And actually, lambda 2 more or less gives you the slope of this. So just knowing the zero doesn't tell you how stretched out this picture is. If you work it out, here's one I prepared earlier. It turns out that the slope is equal to the square root of minus lambda 1 over lambda 2, which looks a little bit evil with the minus there until you remember that's positive and that's negative. So this quantity is actually positive. That's the slope of the asymptotic line. I mean, I didn't see that required, but if you if you really want to get a grip on it, that's, that's the true picture. It's not enough just to say this. You, you sort of need to know what the other eigenvalue is. All right, so that's all very easy. The whole point, then, is going to be to do a more complicated form and reduce it to this by means of this symmetric um, or spectral theorem type of decomposition. So let's do an example of this. I would like to consider the quadratic form q of x is equal to 6x1 squared plus 4x1x2 plus 3x2 squared. And we want to plot, plot this. Okay, so 
I mean, I could have just asked, if you think about this in elementary terms, plot the curve 6x squared plus 4xy plus 3y squared equals 1. There you go. Plot that. What does it look like? That's the question. Okay, you could have... I want you to understand that this is a question from high school math, except that you couldn't have solved it really in high school math. Plot this. I don't know, I mean, it's a conic section, but what is it? How would you find it? Well, you probably have to find some points. And Now we're in a position, finally, to be able to analyze these conics properly. Okay, so first of all, we're going to diagonalize. Diagonalize what? Well, we have to find the matrix first. So Q equals X, transpose AX, where A is the symmetric matrix 6, 3, and then split the 4 up into 2, 2. Okay, so that you can just write. But if you don't believe it, you check it. You check it, and you see that you get the right answer. Okay, so now we have to diagonalize A. So we go through our whole spiel and shebang. First, the eigenvalues. Here goes. Det A minus lambda I equals debt 6 minus lambda, 3 minus lambda, 2, 2, 2, equals 6 minus lambda, 3 minus lambda, minus 4, which is lambda squared minus 9 lambda, plus 18 minus 4. Okay, 14 looks like it's 2 times 7, so this is lambda minus 7, lambda minus 2. And we have found that lambda is 2 or 7. Those are the eigenvalues. So now we have to find some eigenvectors. I'm still leaving the top one there for later. OK, so let's take lambda. So here's the eigenvectors. Take lambda equals 7 and look at the kernel of a minus 7i, which is the kernel of the 2 by 2 matrix um, just subtract 7 from the diagonals of A, and you get that. And so the kernel, this is obviously a multiple of this, so the kernel is the span. If I take 2 plus 1 of that, I should get the right answer. Okay, lambda equals 2, the kernel of A minus 2i is the kernel of, this time we get 4, 2, 2, 1, and this time you get the span. If you take one lot of that and minus two lots of that, that'll give you zero. Okay, reality check. These ought to be orthogonal because they're different eigenvectors, as in with different eigenvalues, of a symmetric matrix. And so it is. That dot that is zero. Now all we have to do is orthonormalize them. So we apply Gram-Schmidt to that. Just divide by its length, divide by its length. And you find, so call this V1 if you like, and that V2. So what we really want is U1 is V1 over its length, which is 1 over root 5. Well, let's write it like this. 2 over root 5, 1 over root 5. And similarly... Story. Notice that the 2 by 2 took a lot less time than the 3 by 3 example we did first. We've just done all the work, and we can say... We can say that A is equal to S D S inverse, where S is the matrix whose columns are 2 over root 5, 1 over root 5, and 1 over root 5 minus 2 over root 5. And D is the diagonal matrix 7, 2. Eigenvalues are written in the correct order corresponding to the order that we did the eigenvectors. All right, well, that's beautiful. So what? What does it mean? 
Well, what it means is if you take any vector x and you express it in terms of these basis vectors here, so if you, want, if you know that x is equal to c1 lots of 2 over root 5, 1 over root 5, plus c2, 1 over root 5, and minus 2 over root 5, and this can be done for any particular x. If x is this, then what this says is then q of x is actually equal to, again, x transpose ax, but that is equal to, and you can just quote this now, c transpose dc. So this is the new basis. In other words, d being 7, 2, this is just 7c1 squared plus 2c2 squared. OK, so what I'm trying to say is the way I would compute what q of x is, instead of going back to the original formula, I would find the c1 and the c2 that make this true, which you can do by inverting the matrix if you really want to, and then plug them in here. But geometrically, we can actually draw the picture right away. You see, if x is c1 times this vector, let's just draw this vector. This vector is in the direction of 2, 1. So, OK, so the root 5 puts you over here. It makes it length 1. So basically, if you are a c1 along this vector, then that's where you are. Now, the other vector is 1, comma, minus 2, which is uh, 1, comma, minus 2. So basically, OK, we have to sort of tip our heads around a little bit. But any x has a coordinate on there and a coordinate on there. Now, we are supposed to draw the equation 7c1 squared plus 2c2 squared equals 1. Well, that is an ellipse on these axes here with dimensions 1. Well, so I go a distance here of 1 over root 7 along that axis. And I go a distance 1 over root 2 along this axis. Why do you do this? Well, because think about the basic ellipse. When it was lambda 1 c1 squared, I always go 1 over root lambda 1. I mean, draw this in the c1 c2 space, and you'll see exactly what it looks like. That's not a bad idea. c1 c2 space looks like this. 1 over root 7, 1 over root 2. That's the, that's the ellipse there. If you don't believe it, put c1 as 1 over root 7, and c2 is 0. You get 1 7th there, right? And why do you change from x, from x to c0, but why from a to b? Does it make the Well, I did the computation before. I mean, the thing is, a is s, d, s inverse. Uh, okay. And s inverse x is c, and x transpose s is c transpose. And the only reason that you can change the inverse to the transpose is because s is orthogonal. That, that's what makes that all work. So it, it just comes from that. But the point is that all we've done is rotate the axes, basically, so that it looks like this. It's still an ellipse centered at 0. But it's a rotated ellipse with respect to the eigen basis. Okay. So now, you see, you can draw any two-dimensional conic section um, or a homogeneous polynomial, it doesn't matter. ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared equals 1. You can just draw that. All you have to do is diagonalize it, and you will either find that you get an ellipse or a hyperbola depending on whether the eigenvalues are both positive or one is negative. If, if both are negative, then there's nothing to draw. <laughs> I mean, if it was, say, minus 3c1 squared minus 4c2 squared equals 1, nothing to draw. So you can't always find a solution. There's no solution to this. But if one of them is positive, you get a hyperbola. If they're both positive, you get an ellipse. Question? But you never actually found C1 or C2. Just well, you don't. There's nothing to find because you don't. You never. You might complain that I never actually found X. Here are all the X's that make it work. Right. All right. Here are all the C's, C1, C2 vectors that make this equal to one. Remember, I'm only drawing a level set here. You might ask me for the level set at 4. There's no level set at minus 1. The level set at 0 is just the origin. Level set at 4 is twice. right? So 
I'm just saying which C's satisfy the equation. Well, in the C1, C2 plane, they're this. Which X's satisfy the original equation? Well, in the X1, X2 plane, they're this. But by the change of basis, it's this. Okay, so there's no C to find, just like there's no X to find. It's a set of C's that work, which correspond to a set of X's. And notice that the change of basis is actually a rotation, although it's a little more sophisticated than a rotation, just because we got a reflection as well. This is the C1 axis, and this is the C2 type axis, and they're at a different parity from the XY. The X is rotated counterclockwise to get the Y, whereas the C is rotated clockwise. C1 is cr rotated clockwise. So it's actually a reflection and a rotation in there, but that's basically how these things work. All right? So any other questions about this? This is an, imp this is an important example. I mean, they, they come up all the time. You've got a two byte, you've got an equation like this, sketch that. that you, you have to know how to do that. Okay, so, so you have to really understand the interplay between the geometry and the algebra. Yeah. How do you draw the one? Well, okay, so first of all, I drew the original one. Okay? Then second of all, I needed to understand what are the eigen, what, how does the change of basis matrix work? What, are the eigen, what is the eigenbasis? And basically, the eigenbasis is just the columns of this matrix. So I drew that vector as one of my new axes. That's my new x-axis. And this vector is my new y-axis. And I wasn't paying too much attention to the denominator. That just makes everything have the correct length units. Right? It's just my grid paper being at the right... You know, but if you don't care about the grid too much, I mean, where's one over root seven? You can just draw it anywhere on the on the graph. It's more the direction that you need. The the change of basis matrix S has columns which are the, exactly the eigenvectors of A, which become the axes of the new situation. That's the whole beauty of the thing. The eigenvectors, as in the eigenbasis that you choose, becomes, and you, you don't have a choice in this case. I mean, the only choice that you have is that you took this basis there. You know, we could have chosen the C2 to be in the correct documentation, as in going the other way. Uh, as in we put a minus 1 there and a 2 here. That's okay, too, in which case then there's no reflection. It's actually just a... It's just a rotation. But it doesn't make a difference to the ellipse, because the ellipse is symmetric anyway. OK, does that, does that clear? Does that answer your question? OK. Any other questions about this example? You have to make sure you can do them, obviously. You need to practice them. All right, so a hyperbola would be the same. I mean, if this happened to be a minus 2 here, but the question was otherwise the same, then you'd be getting this, this hyperbola instead. Still got the one over root seven, but then the other one would be would be imaginary as it were, and you wouldn't get any other intercepts of those rotated axes. All right, let's look at the three-dimensional case, and then maybe we can go on to some differential equations. Okay, so that was the two-dimensional case. The three D case, well, I think most of you took Math 201 uh, last semester. We looked at equations like this. Lambda 1 x squared plus lambda 2 y squared plus lambda 3 z squared equals 1. We've looked at how to sketch that. And we decided that if all three are positive, if all lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3 are positive, this is an ellipsoid. If, say, lambda 1 and lambda 2 are bigger than 0, but lambda 3 is negative, you get a hyperboloid of one sheet, which looks something like this. So it's like a hyperboloid, a hyperbola revolved around the z-axis. If, on the other hand, one of them is positive and the other two are negative, 
we got a hyperboloid of two sheets. Which, well, it depends which one is positive, I guess. In this case, we have no, we have an x-intercept, but we have no z-intercept, so it will be like that. It depends which of the coordinates are which, but in this case, we just get x-intercepts. Here, you get x and y-intercepts, you see, which is fine because they're both positive. It's the z it can't be any z-intercepts because the coefficient is negative. So, it has to be like this. Now, of course, we also saw paraboloids, but they have linear terms. The paraboloids came when there's no z-squared, but there's a z. We're only dealing with the homogeneous case here. Of course, you can complete squares and all that sort of stuff as well. But these would be the three cases. By the way, if they're all negative, again, there's nothing to sketch. So that's, those are the only possible cases. OK, so what's new? Well, what's new is that in Math 201, pretty much everything we did was just diagonal. Or it was all homogeneous. Really, there were no mixed terms is what I'm trying to say. But now we can do some more exotic things. So, for example, Q of x is minus x1 squared plus 4x1x2 plus 2x2 squared minus 4x1x3 plus 2x2x3 plus 2x3 squared equals 1. Ha <laughs> ha. OK, well, this is a really unfair thing for me to ask, except that we've already done most of the work. Because you see, it turns out that q of x is mercifully equal to x transpose ax, where a is equal to minus 1, 2 on the next diagonal, 2 on the next diagonal. Take half of that, 4, and put the 2, 2. Take half of that and put the minus 2, minus 2 and half of the two there, one, one. And guess what? That's our matrix from before. Ha ha. OK, so now <laughs> you would launch, unfortunately, if you hadn't done it already, you would have to do all the work that we did at the beginning to get to here. Yes, it's true. Sort of. I'll show a little bit of relief if you like in a second. But let's pretend that we've just played Pat by the rules and we've expressed A as S, D, S inverse for that. OK, what this means is that A is also, well, that Q of X, rather, again, is X transpose A, X, which can also be written as C transpose D, C, where C is x with respect to the coordinates of the basis. And the geometry will be clear in a second. But let's just graph what we have. The c, if you remember, d is 3, 3, minus 3. So you get 3c1 squared plus 3c2 squared minus 3c3 squared. And that's supposed to equal 1. All right, so now what we've got to do is the following. Here's x, here's y, here's z. We have to take the columns of S and try to just draw the new axes. And it's going to be difficult, but we'll just try. This column is 1, 2. Again, the root 5 is just giving us our normalization. So if I take x equals 1 and y equals 2, this vector here that's hard to see, it's not pointing down. I mean this to be in the xy plane here. And this is why the thing is bloody impossible to draw. So that's 1, 2, 0 direction. The other one is minus 2 in the x direction, plus 1 in the y direction, plus 5 in the z direction. So it's going up here. And then finally, I have 2 minus 1, 1. So I go 2 here minus 1 there, and 1 up. So it sort of looks right angled. OK, so again, really hard to draw on the board. 
But, and again, the lengths I haven't paid much attention to. I just want to set the axes. This new set of axes is a rotation of the standard set of axes. Maybe with the reflection as well. I, I haven't checked the right-hand rule of it, you know. There's a certain right-hand rule, blah, blah, but it doesn't really matter because everything is symmetric. Now, if you just sketched this curve, this thing here, rather, with respect to the regular old C1, C2, C3 axes, C1, C2, C3, what would it look like? That's a Math 201 type of question. Well, by what I said, it's a hyperboloid of one sheet. If you think about it, it has intercepts at 1 over root 3 on both this axis and this axis, and then also minus 1 over root 3. So if you set C3 as 0, you just get a circle. On the other hand, there's no C3 intercepts, so you get this hyperboloid of revolution. Well, guess what you get here? You get, here is the C1 style axis, here was the C2 axis, and here was the C3 axis. So now you go, go 1 over root 3 here, 1 over root 3 here, and of course the same in the other directions. Draw a circle like that and draw your hyperboloid with this going down the middle. Good luck trying to draw that on the test. It's exactly this rotated so that C1 is now this column, and C2 is now that column, and C3 is that column, however you want to draw it. All right? So it's a hyperboloid of one sheet. And the real killer deal is that that C3 vector is going down the middle. That's, that's the real deal. All right? Any questions about that? How did you choose the C1, C3 axis in the curve? Well, I didn't really have much of a choice. I mean, the, we'd, we'd done all the work before. I mean, you've got to go back and do the diagonalization of A from before. Well, I had to draw this vector, one, one, two, zero, zero, and I call that C, see what direction that is, and that's C1. And then this one is C2, and this one's C3. Now, here's how I could have saved a little bit of trouble. Do you remember that we did the Gram-Schmidt to get this, instead of going with our first gut feeling of what the two vectors were? The fact is, there's nothing special about these two vectors. If you think about it, the C1 and C2 What's important here is the plane that they're in. It doesn't matter what the choice of C1 and C2 is. You could revolve this thing and it's the same. And that is because there is a symmetry. These are both 1 over root 3. If this was an ellipse instead of a circle, then that wouldn't be the case. But then you wouldn't have both eigenvalues being the same. So the point is you could actually choose any two vectors from the eigenspace including the original two non gram schmidt ones, and just said, oh, well, look, I don't care what the axes are. In some sense, there's not really two ax three axes. There's like a plane and an axis. And the plane is the th eigenspace of lambda equals 3, and the axis is the lambda equals minus 3. And you'll see that if you revolve this just around this eigenspace, it's the same picture. So instead of going to the whole Gram-Schmidt thing, you could just identify what that plane is. See, what I'm saying is to graph this object, all you need is to know, OK, here's the plane, and here's the axis, and this is a distance of 1 over root 3 here, all the way around. And that will give it to you. So you actually don't need to find an orthonormal basis within the plane, not to sketch it. Of course, if someone says, find the matrix that's orthogonal, then you need to. All right. Are there any other questions? I'm going pretty fast, I admit. But that's pretty much all there is to quadratic forms. That was a bit fast, wasn't it? There is one other little tidbit of information that doesn't seem to go with anything else. But since it's in the syllabus, I might as well mention it. So, a completely unrelated fact. Well, okay, fact. Okay, so if, if A is positive definite, 
Well, okay, no. Let's say it like this. Let A M be the M by M matrix at the top left-hand corner of A. So in this example, this matrix by itself is A1. This 2 by 2 thing is A2, and this 3 by 3 is A3. So the result is A is positive, well, let's, A is positive, definite, if and only if the determinant of this reduced matrix is positive for all M. This assumes that A is symmetric. So I guess by looking at this immediately, you can say that it is not positive definite because there's a 1 there, a minus 1 there. The determinant of this is negative. So is the determinant of this. Anyway, I don't want to get bogged down by that. That's just this. Anyway. Geometrically, by the way, what can you say about the level set of a positive definite thing? Suppose Q is positive definite. And Q of x equals 1 looks like what? Well, what is it in two dimensions? Both eigenvalues have to be positive, so you get what shape? An ellipse. In three dimensions, you get an ellipsoid. So this is basically an ellipsoid or a generalized hyperellipsoid. Whatever the sphere, if you could just draw a sphere in n dimensions. This is a squished, stretched sphere. You don't get any hyperboloid stuff. It's, 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 it's bounded set. Any other possibility, and it will be unbounded and will not look so nice. You've got hyperboloid type of stuff going on. All right. Well, it really deserves a little more attention than I've given it. but I. I've given you the basic aim. I mean, apart from that sort of fact, I haven't given you any examples of that, but the real idea is can you sketch these, quad these level sets of quadratic forms? And the answer is yes, hopefully. All you have to do is find the symmetric matrix, find the eigenvalues of it, and the orthonormal eigenbasis, and then draw the nice one, and then ro rotate it so that you get the actual one. I don't say that there are no other types of problems, but those, that, that's the big type of problem if you look at past finals. All right, so unfortunately, I must move on then to the next chapter, the last chapter, 9.1. And now we move on to something completely different, apparently, which is differential equations. Now, I'm going to present a little bit different to the way the book does. They not very. This good old chestnut of a differential equation, I'm using x in, as a function of t. This is just the exponential growth or decay equation, depending on the sign of a. And we've seen that the solution vector version of this. So I want to understand, let x be a vector. What does this mean? A is just a constant. Yeah, A is a constant. So X is some initial value times E to the AT. That's just how it, I mean, we've seen that. Single variable calculus. Okay, so here I'm changing X to a vector and little a to a constant matrix capital A. So what does this mean? Let's see if we can make sense of this. This means the following. That, well, the first of all, the vector on the left should be interpreted as dx1 dt up to dxn dt. So this is just to be interpreted as, OK, x is a vector, x1 through xn. All we're doing is differentiating each component, considering each component to be a function of t. And this is now a matrix A 
times the vector x itself. And so if you actually work out what that means, by multiplying it out, if I give A its standard entries, this means essentially that dx1 dt is equal to, just multiplying this out, you get a11x1 plus a12x2 up to a1nxn. dx2 dt is similar except different coefficients. And so on, all the way up to dxn dt. And you get this lovely mess here. OK, so what is this? What have I just written? What this says is we've got a whole bunch of variables, n of them, x1 up to xn. And each of them depends on t. OK, so they could be populations of different tribes or different animals or something like that. So we have n different classes, whatever it is. And this is saying the rate of change of x1 is basically, it only depends linearly on the values of x1, x2, and up to xn. It's this constant times x1 plus this constant times x2. It's a linear function of all the variables. And similarly, x2 depends linearly on them and all the way up to xn. So they're coupled. They are coupled. And the standard sort of idea, the most basic example is sort of the predator-prey or something where you have two different types of animals and, and they sort of attack each other or one of them attacks the other one and what the other one breeds or something like that. I mean, this is, just, this is just like a population breeding type of equation here. This says the rate of increase of x is some multiple of x itself. So the more rabbits you have, of course, the more they breed and you get exponential growth. Well, this says that you've got the exponential growth in x, but actually the number of x2s also affects this. And if a12 is negative, then the more there are of the bad animal, the, the predator, the, that affects x, causes it to grow less fast, or maybe even decay if it doesn't breed quickly enough. If it doesn't outbreed its aggressors, as it were. Or maybe it can turn on the aggressor and become all badass or something. But anyway, that's harder to model. Um, anyway, so here you have n simultaneous linear differential equations. And they are, it looks tricky because there are n of them and they're all coupled together. You can't just solve one at a time. But luckily, because everything is linear, you actually might be able to solve just one at a time if you can diagonalize the whole situation. Now, I'm not going to assume that this matrix A is symmetric. It's not necessarily symmetric. If it were, then you could definitely diagonalize it. If it's not, then I'm just going to hope that you can. So let's see what happens if A is diagonal. Then most of this goes away. In fact, let's say A is diagonal equal again to lambda 1 up to lambda n. Then this just becomes dx1 dt is lambda 1 x1, and there's nothing else. dx2 dt is lambda 2 x2, and so on, up to dxn dt equals lambda n xn. So what's the point of that? The point is that they're not coupled anymore. The, if A happened to be diagonal, the, the variables are independent. And you could write down directly what x is. It's some constant, which I'll call c1 for the moment, e to the lambda 1t dot 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 up to cn e to the lambda nt. So you just solve the first one. The first one is x1 equals some constant e to the lambda 1t. And the same and the same. It just comes from the one-dimensional thing. So the diagonal case is nothing more than just n of the original ones that have nothing to do with each other, and you can just write down the solution. And so there is hope 
even if A is not diagonal, but is diagonalizable for solving the situation. And that's exactly what the, the subject of this section is. So let's see what happens here. All right. Suppose that A is diagonalizable. Okay, so to set the scene, you are given a collection like this, but a specific collection. There might be only three variables, and you just grab the coefficients and put them in a matrix. You don't have to double them like I did for the quadratic model. It's all very straightforward. You just grab these coefficients straight out of the equation and whack them in a matrix A. Okay, and it's going to be square. Then you try to diagonalize it by finding the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors and looking to see if you've got a basis of eigenvectors. Okay? If it is, if it isn't, you're sort of screwed. Okay? You, you can't really deal with that case in this course. But if it is, then what can you say? Well, here is the result. Then you could write S equals, uh, sorry, A equals S ds inverse, where d is diagonal, and the diagonal actually has the eigenvalues of a, of course, on it. Oh, when I say you can't do it in this course, except for uh, what we'll do in section 9.2, so there is some hope. But really, that only deals with 2 by 2 versions, and you'll see how, how much more difficult that is. So I take it back. There is some hope. But in any case, let's for the moment just do e d's case, which is a is s d s inverse. The difference between this and the symmetric case, I'm not assuming this is symmetric, so you don't know for sure that s is orthogonal. It's not orthogonal in general. So s is just invertible. That's all you can say. It's a change of basis matrix. So you have a is s d s inverse. Then what is the solution? The solution to the system x dx dt equals ax, which again means all that junk on the right hand board, is x of t is. S, a new diagonal matrix, which looks like this. E to the lambda 1 up to E to the lambda n. S inverse times the initial condition x0. It has to be a vector. I'm sorry, I left out all the t's here. There's t's there. E to the lambda 1t, to e to the lambda nt. S inverse x0, where x0 is x of 0. So it's the initial condition. And we might as well do a reality check. When t equals 0, if you plug in t equals 0, all of these, all of these diagonal entries are 1. So this is the identity. So you get S, S inverse, the identity not doing anything, which is itself the identity, and you do, in fact, get X of 0 is X0, the vector. OK, so I've given you the answer without proving it. But actually, it's not that hard to prove. But you do have to change the basis to see how it's done. The alternate characterization in terms of the basis is worthy of statement. And it's also useful in actually doing the question. So alternatively, another, another way of looking at exactly what I've just said is as follows. Alternatively, suppose that S has these vectors v1 up to vn. v1 up to 
then you can write the solution more directly than this as follows. C1 e to the lambda 1 t v1 plus c2 e to the lambda 2 t v2 plus dot 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 plus cn e to the lambda n t vn. Uh, that last one's not very clear. I'll give myself a little more room. Cn e to the lambda n t vn. Where the constants c are determined like this. This is x with respect to that basis. Okay, so let's just digest what I've written. According to this, x of t is some linear combination of the basis vectors s. Okay. By the, by the way, this is exactly the same statement as this. It's just written in a different way. Using, I, I've gotten rid of the matrices, basically. But let, let me explain what it actually means, because it's kind of key. V1 up to Vn is a basis of Rn. And it's a very special basis, because it's an eigenbasis. All these vectors are eigenvectors of the original matrix A. Okay, So it's just a different basis. X of t is a point in Rn. It's this particle that moves around in n-dimensional space. And the coordinates are the values of the variables x1 up to xn. So it's moving around. And of course, at any one time, it has coordinates with respect to this new basis. So it's, it, I mean, it has to be something v1 plus something v2 plus dot, 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 plus something vn. Well, what are those somethings? Well, at time t equals 0, it's c1, c2, up to cn by definition. So i.e., the initial is c1, v1, up to cn, vn. I mean, that's, you don't know where it starts. Lovely chalk all over the place. OK, it starts somewhere. And so wherever it starts, it has some coordinates. The question is, how does it evolve from that point? Where does it move? And the answer is that you introduce these exponentials into the coordinates there. So that if, say, all the lambdas are positive, then the coefficients get bigger exponentially. So this tells you not only, well, this tells you what the coordinates of x are with respect to this new basis at any time. And they're fairly simple because of this diagonal relationship here. OK, so this in particular allows you to solve some very, some very specific problems. And I want to look at. Every time we have an device, we always use the S, which is made of eigenvalues, right? Eigenvectors. Yes, the S is made up of eigenvectors, and then D is made up of the eigenvalues in the same order as the eigenvectors. That's all it is. OK, but I want to give a very sort of specific example. Let's say we take dx dt, I'll, I'll do it explicitly, dx1 dt is equal to minus 4x1 plus 3x2. And dx2 dt, which could have been called dy dt for all I care, I mean you could, you know, there's, there's nothing special about these numbers, is 2x1 minus 3x2. Okay, so that's given. And you're also given the initial condition that x1 is equal to 1, and x2 is equal to 0. OK, so the question is to solve that system. And I want to use the theory that I've just written up here. OK. Oh, that's a very good question. It's just oversight. Thank you. Pointing this out. Yes, x1 of 0 is 1, and x2 of 0 is 0. Well, the first thing we have to do is write this in matrix vector form as dx dt is equal to ax, where a is equal to this matrix minus 4, 3, 2, minus 3. 
and also x0, the initial vector, is 1, 0. Okay, so all I did is rewrite the problem in SSA matrix and vector notation. All right? Next, diagonalize A. So we've got to pull out the old machinery. The determinant of A minus lambda I is de minus 4 minus lambda, 3, 2, minus 3 minus lambda. Get very used to doing this sort of computation. So lambda squared plus 7 lambda plus 12 minus 6 is 6, and you get lambda plus 6, lambda plus 1. And so lambda equals minus 6 or minus 1. Now, which would you do that? Then? I guess minus 6 first, it doesn't really matter. Take the case where lambda is minus 6. So now you need to look at the kernel of A plus 6i. Six plus 6i, so you get kernel of 2, 3, 2, th uh, 2, 3, 2, 3. You just add 6 to the diagonals there. And so that kernel can be written as the span of minus 3, 2. And then lambda equals minus 1. You get the kernel of A plus I, which is the kernel of, add 1 to this, you get minus 3, 3, 2, minus 2. And this is clearly the span of 1, comma 1. So stare at that for a second. This means that A is S, D, S inverse, where S is made up of the eigenvectors that we just found, minus 3, 2, and then 1, 1. And D is the eigenvalues in the corresponding order on the diagonal, minus 6 and minus 1. Okay, so that's part of the theory. Notice this is not an orthogonal matrix. That's fine. No problem. Cannot even be made into one. That's because A is not symmetric to start with. All right, so we have this. So what? Well, I've given you two characterizations of the solution. Let's try the second one first. According to this, x of t is equal to c1 e to the lambda 1 t v1 plus c2 e to the lambda 2 t v2, where, let's be more precise about it, it's c1 e to the lambda 1 t, lambda 1 is minus 6, so it's e to the minus 6 t times v1, which is the first column of s, plus c2 e to the lambda 1 t, is minus t, and then v2 is the second column of s, 1, 1. Now, that's actually the general solution to the differential equation without the initial value condition. It's actually the general solution. So let's just pursue this for the moment. Let's pack it up into, uh, into two, well, unpack it into two equations. So according to this, x1 of t is equal to c1 times, so it's minus 3c1 e to the minus 6t plus c2 e to the minus t. And x2 of t is equal to 2c1 e to the minus 6t plus c2 e to the minus t. That's the general solution, i.e. non-initial value problem solution. I didn't prove any of this for you. I didn't prove that fact. What that fact, the, the fact is in these two things up here. I've just told you what the solution is. The reason why it works is because you need to 
do a linear transformation of x that changes the basis. And when you do that, the derivatives are all fine because linear combinations just involve adding up linear factors times the co um, coefficients times the variables. And you know how nice it is to differentiate with a constant. The constant just comes out, no problem. See, all you're doing is just multiplying by constants, basically. And so you've transformed the stuff to a new basis where the thing is diagonal, and you can do the separation there. So that's a bit of a hand-wavy thing. Of course, the proof is in the book. I wish I had a little more time to do it, but I, I don't. Anyway, uh, we ought to just check that this solves the differential equation. Let's, let's just check it out and see. You can actually have to do this. And we haven't quite finished it because we don't have the initial condition yet. But let's just try dx1 dt. Let's see what we get. According to this, well, we just have to differentiate this. You get 18 c1 e to the minus 6t minus c2 e to the minus t. And dx2 dt is equal to minus 12 c1 e to the minus 6t minus c2 e to the minus t. OK, so we found the derivatives, but we also have to consider what's minus 4x1 plus 3x2. Well, we have minus 4 lots of this plus 3 lots of this. We have to work out how many of this term we have and how many of this term we have. Well, I'm just looking at the original equation here. I want dx1 dt to be equal to f minus 4x1 plus 3x2. So I've computed the left-hand side of this. I'm going to compute the right-hand side now. Okay? I'm just checking that this answer that I've plucked out of the air by means of this eigenvalue, eigenvector stuff uh, actually works. So I've got minus 4 lots of this is 12, plus 3 lots of this is indeed 18c1 e to the minus 6t. And I have minus 4 of this plus 3 of the same thing, minus c2 e to the minus t. Oh, look, that equals this. OK, that's the first equation is good. How about the second equation? We need to look at what 2x1 minus 3x2 is. And if we do it, we find 2 lots of this is minus 6, minus 3 lots of this is minus 12, another 6. So you get minus 12c1 e to the minus 6t. And then min, uh, 2 lots of this minus 3 lots of this is minus c2 e to the minus t. So guess what? Both of the equations match on both sides. So this is just the check here. The left-hand side of the first equation equals the right-hand side of the first equation. OK, is that, is that clear? And then I checked the second equation as well. So we've simultaneously solved both the equations. We just don't have the correct initial value. That's all we need left is the initial value. So we come back over here. We need to, given x of 0 equals x0 is 1, 0, I believe, was the prescribed condition, we now need to find c1 and c2. So we come back over here and plug in t equals 0. So I'm going to just rewrite that equation. You get x of t is c1 e to the minus 6t. What's that vector? Th minus 3, 2 plus c2 e to the minus t, 1, 1. All right, so at t equals 0, plug that in, and what do you get? You get 1, 0 is c1 times minus 3, 2 plus c2 times 1, 1. And you have to find c1, c2. Well, of course, this is just your original matrix S minus 3, 2, 1, 1 times c1, c2. If you don't believe it, multiply it out and you'll see. That's exactly what it is. This is not so a far phase because I told you that C are the coordinates of this vector with respect to this basis. And the way you find the coordinates with respect to a basis is to multiply by the inverse of the matrix. This is just S. It's not surprising that this all happens.
So we just need to we just need to find C1, C2 is S inverse 1, 0. We just need to invert this matrix. It's not very, not very hard. The determinant is minus 6. No, minus 5. So it's one, minus 1 fifth. Switch these around. Put minuses in front of those. Multiply this out, and you get minus one fifth, two fifths. So that's C1, and that's C2. And so now we have the complete solution going back to the original equation. X of t is C1 is minus a fifth, e to the minus 6t minus 3 comma 2, plus C2 is 2 fifths, e to the minus t, 1, 1. Or if you want to unpack them, you can go back to this version of it, x1, t, c1 is minus uh, 1 fifth, so you get 3 fifths e to the minus 6t plus 2 fifths e to the minus t, and x2 of t is equal to 2c1 is minus 2 fifths plus 2 fifths. And so that's the specialization of the differential equation to the initial value. All right, question. Um, for C1 and C2, why is yours, um, I, I understand how you got divided by 5, but if you used just the values uh, minus 1, 2 for C1 and C2, would that not also work? You're saying if C1 is minus 1 and C2 is 2, would it work? Well, no, because if you put minus 1 and 2, you get 5, 0. That would give you an initial condition of 5, 0. You're in the right vector direction, but you started actually at the wrong point. Okay. Okay, you have an initial population of 5 and 0 instead of 1 and 0. I'll agree the ratio between the two is the same. But okay? Which equations? So you mean... It, you mean to find C1 and C2? Okay, yes, you could just start with there, plug in t equals 0. But you will still get exactly the same equations. You will get minus 3C1 plus C2 is 1, and 2C1 plus C2 equals 0. Right, but if you start them together? Well, it comes down to the matrix equation, minus 3, 2, 1, 1, C1, C2 equals 1, 0. However you want to skin it, I mean, you could solve that by uh, Gauss-Jordan in instead of inverting if you want to. But for 2 by 2, it's easier to just invert. Y you always get the same equation. Everything, everything, everything is the same. In fact, if you do it the other way, which I don't really have time to do, but the other method was just to write down the solution. Okay, so this is the or. You can write down that x of t is equal to s, and then e to the lambda 1t, e to the lambda 2t, s inverse x0. And this has sort of a nice similarity because you see a is s d s inverse, where d is just lambda 1, lambda 2. And so this is quite similar to that in a sense. So, but anyway, you could actually write this down and do it all in one go. Minus 3, 2, 1, 1, e to the minus 6t, e to the minus t, and then you invert this one, which is 1 fifth, 1 minus 3, um, 2, 1. So you switch those around. Um, what am I doing? Somehow I've written S. Yeah, no, this is. How did I get this wrong? When you invert it, you switch these two around. And you put minuses there. OK, good. Times the initial condition. And if, if you just work all that out, <laughs> you just do the, I mean, you, you have to multiply this matrix vector, and then you just work that out, you get the same answer. All this does is sort of com collapse all the steps. Look, here's the S inverse x0 step that we did. That finds the Cs. And then this is the V1 and the V2. 
and that's the coefficient of v1 and the coefficient of v2. So actually, <laughs> this is exactly the same as the other one in shorthand. If you don't believe it, just multiply it out, and you'll see that this multiplication, just those two, gives you this. And this multiplication, if you just call that vector c1, c2, all that junk, c1, c2, you get exactly this. And then when you put in the c1, c2, that's that. And so it just kind of does it all together. It's kind of nice. So you choose your poison, if you like. I mean, this is, this is sort of the shorthand and quick and dirty way of doing it, but it kind of obscures what's going on. And I like the other way as an introductory sort of way because it says, okay, there's this basis. You're going to write x of t in terms of the basis given the initial point in terms of the basis. And all you're doing is exponentiating the coordinates. Now, I would like to just compare with the discrete dynamical system for a moment. So it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to do 9.2, unfortunately, but I'll have to cover that extensively during the, during the uh, final reviews. So here goes. I want to compare a couple of things. So here we saw dx dt equals ax. And we saw the solution was x of t is s e to the lambda 1 t e to the lambda n t s inverse x 0. Now, we also looked at discrete dynamical systems earlier where you have x of t plus 1 is a x of t. And this is actually not that different. This is the infinitesimal version of this, the continuously compounded version of this. So this is like an interest rate of a that is just applied on a discrete step, and this is the continuous version. So these give you powers, and these give you exponentials. And in fact, if A is diagonalizable, so basically the solution of this we already found in our thought bubble, that x of t is just the teeth power of A times x0. But we saw if A is diagonalizable, then instead of multiplying A, you just take the teeth power of D. So that, that was the beauty of this. So here t has to be an integer. So in other words, you have x of t is s lambda 1 to the power of t up to lambda n to the power of t. That's the teeth power of the diagonal matrix. So actually, they're pretty much the same. But instead of having the teeth power, we have the exponential in the continuous case. Now, let's just take another look at this matrix here. You could think of this matrix as e to the lambda 1 to the power t, up to e to the lambda n to the power t. So actually, it's still a teeth power matrix. It's just that instead of the eigenvalues themselves of a, you have the exponentials of the eigenvalues of A. So my general sort of fact is if A is diagonalizable, then the continuous version dx dt equals ax is the same as the discrete x of t plus 1 equals a x of t, except that the eigenvalues must be exponentiated exped for the continuous. That's just not obvious at all. But it turns out to be true, and we sort of found out why. All right, so I basically only have time to look at the end of 9.1, which concerns the two-dimensional case. 
as I said, 9.2 is concerned with the complex case, in, especially for 2 by 2 matrices, which basically means, okay, if A cannot be diagonalized, but just because it has, in, in the case where it has complex eigenvalues, then can you still solve the differential equations? And the answer is yes, and it tells you how. So it's a different case, and I don't have time to do it, unfortunately. But anyway, here's what I'd like to look at. So you have the 2D case. 2D case looks like this. You have dx dt, again, is ax, where a is 2 by 2, just like in the example that we gave. And I'll come back to the example in a specific case. What I want to do is graph a phase portrait. And we sort of did this for the discrete case, but it's even nicer in the continuous case. So here's the idea. This equation describes the evolution of a particle moving in the two-dimensional space, as in the plane. And it could start here and then go on this sort of curve. I don't know, it depends what the, who knows what the curve looks like. But you see, the way it moves is only dependent on where it is. If you know where it is, then you know what it's doing. Because you compute AX, it tells you its velocity. So it moves a little bit. Then you can recompute AX, and you do that infinitesimally, and it maps out the path. The point is that if you start somewhere that is not on the complete path to infinity, somewhere else, then the path will not intersect. It cannot intersect. Because if this were, as soon as it gets on this path, it has to join the original one. So that means it would have been part of the path. So you basically flesh out a bunch of different sort of parallel or concentric type of paths. And the phase portrait consists of drawing some of these paths that you get. And we have to say, what are these paths? OK, so that's the last few minutes of the class. I'm going to sort of try to understand what are these paths. Now, here is what it looks like. We know that x1 of t, or x of t rather, the vector, is equal to c1 e to the lambda 1 t v1 plus c2 e to the lambda 2 t v2, where these are the eigenvectors. v1 and v2 are the eigenvectors of A. And we're assuming that these exist. And let's assume that they're different, as in we don't just have one eigenspace. We have two eigenspaces. OK, so what does this look like? Well, here's the plane. There's these special vectors v1. And actually, it's not the length of v1 that matters. It's just the direction of v1. And then we have a v2. And of course, you have to adjust these to where they are, depending on the problem. Now, according to this, if you start at v1, so let's suppose that c2 equals 0. So if c2 equals 0, then x of t is just equal to c1 v1. So what happens? Well, it depends whether lambda 1 is positive or negative. So what this is saying is if you start somewhere on v1, you always stay on v1. You never stray off v1. If lambda 1 is positive, then you just go whoosh to infinity exponentially fast. And if lambda 2 is negative, I'm sorry, if lambda 1 is negative, this looks like e to the minus something t. So you actually go and you get to 0, sort of, except you never actually get there. You just get really close really fast, and then you just spend eternity just taking the babiest of baby steps towards 0 without actually getting there. OK, so if you start on v1, the special eigenvector, you never leave it. And the same with v2. If you start on v2, you just stay on v2. What about if you're somewhere else? Well, well it depends on the interaction, interaction between lambda 1 and lambda 2 then. See, you just have to work out what happens to this formula. OK, so let's start off with the case where lambda 1 is greater than lambda 2 is greater than 0. So they're both positive. That means that if you start on v1, you get whisked off to infinity. If you start on v2, you get whisked off to infinity. But if you start on the other side of 0, then, as in some negative multiple, you get whisked off to infinity that way. And the same with v2. No, because, okay, so in the discrete case, 
it, it's greater than one that matters because you have lambda 1 to the power of t and lambda 2 to the power of t. In the continuous case, the fact that you have an exponential means it's the sign of lambda that matters. So if lambda is negative, then e to the minus goes to 0. So that's actually the only difference between the continuous case phase portrait and the discrete case, except that the discrete case is also going like this, chonk, 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 whereas the continuous case is going All right, so it is continuous. Now, um, let's look at the x co So the first coordinate, x1, is c1 e to the lambda 1 t times, well, this is not the x1 coordinate. This is the v1 coordinate, v1 coordinate. And the v2 coordinate is c2 e to the lambda 2t. So I want to imagine, um, actually, allow me, if you don't mind, to change this to a v1 and this to a v2. It's just a little easier to deal with. So uh, I mean, of course, you have to be able to adapt. But let, let's call this v1 and v2, just for this picture. OK, so the v1 coordinate is this, the v2 coordinate. Now, I want to think of this as like a y-axis, and this is like an x-axis, even though it's not. But just for my sanity of trying to draw the damn thing, I want to think of this as y, and this is x. So what's the relationship between these two? Well, I mean, the c's make it a little bit of a pain, but let's assume, I mean, they're sort of constant. So ignore them for the moment. You see that y is equal to x to the power of lambda 1 over lambda 2, up to a constant. So let's put the constant in there. Do you believe this? Take this coordinate and raise it to the power lambda 1 over lambda 2. Because the power multiplies, you'll get e to the lambda 1t. And then the constant has to be chosen to make that work. But this, is, this power here, lambda 1 over lambda 2, is bigger than 1. So it's like x squared or something. And so you get some sort of trajectory that looks like that, or like this, or like this, depending on what the constant is. They're sort of all parallel, and they're all distorted because v1 and v2 are not at right angles. If they were at right angles, they was, this would actually be like a power. It would be power like x squared. Power. Oh, I was just clever. No, I mean, <laughs> you take this coordinate, and you raise it to the power lambda 1 over lambda 2. And it turns e to the lambda 2t into e to the lambda 1t. Okay. And if you have the correct constant out the front, you can also turn c2 into c1. And so this is constant. It doesn't depend on anything else, just the problem, whereas this changes depending on where you start. So you get these parallel meshes, and the same thing for these, for this side here, un underneath. OK, and then the direction that goes is all the way down to infinity. Everything goes to infinity. All right, so that's case one. I'm not going to spend nearly as long on the other two cases, because I don't really have much time left. But I kind of wanted to do this other case that we did. Um, OK, if lambda 1 is positive, but lambda 2 is negative, then what happens is you still have this v1. You still have this v2. And of course, you still stay on these eigenvectors. But when you're here, you're going up. But when you're at v2, you're going down. So that is because the v2 coordinate is e to the lambda 2t, and lambda 2 is negative. So as t goes to infinity, you go to 0. So in this case, you have the v1 coordinate, again, is c1 e well, to the lambda 1t, and c2 e to the lambda 2t as before. And once again, you have this y equals c x to the lambda 1 over lambda 2. But now this is negative. This is negative. And of course, x to the minus 1 is a hyperboloid. Um, and any other negative power, you get something pretty similar. So you get these hyperboloid type of things here. That's the relationship between the two coordinates. I don't believe that relationship's explained very well in the book. In particular, this expression I didn't see. And then, of course, the directions always send you to infinity in the v1 direction or minus infinity if you prefer, and 0 in the v2 direction. So you get that sort of pattern. And then just moving over here for the last case where they're both negative, of course, then you're back to the first case. So if they're both negative with lambda 1 still bigger than lambda 2, 
Now the power x to the lambda 1 over lambda 2 is positive again, but less than 1. And so this is biased in the v2 direction. It's more like x to the 1 half. And now all the arrows point inwards. Both the coordinates go to 0. And this is actually the case in our example. And if you'll give me a couple more minutes, I'll just explain what I'm talking about. In our example, we found the value of a minus 6 and minus 1. That was the previous example that I did. And the eigenvectors that we found were, I don't even remember now, what was it, 3 minus 2? I wrote it up so many times. Well, there it is, minus 3, 2, and 1, 1. So the picture of the phase portrait in this case is as follows. We need to find the vector minus 3, 2. Minus 3, 2 is here. That's one eigenspace. And the other one is 1, 1 which is not quite orthogonal, but kind of close. So this is the 1, 1 direction, and this is the minus 3, 2 direction. And according to this, you're at e to the minus 6t, so it goes to 0 quite quickly in that direction, and only at e to the minus t in this direction. So essentially then, you're in this case where you have these curves like this. These are actually sixth powers. This is like y equals x to the sixth if you turned your head like this. These are different constant times y equals x to the sixth. But y equals this leads to dual because it's the... So you see, I'm saying it goes to zero quicker on that direction than in this direction. But in every case, the arrows point inwards. So that's the phase portrait for that. So it's a special case of this where you just put the v's in the right direction. A quick question, and then we're out of time. Yeah, actually, the phase portrait doesn't tell you anything about the initial condition. I agree. That's the general sort of case. The 1, 0 is a specific case where you start here, and there's your path from there. So it's going to lie on one of the trajectories. By the way, the trajectories do not go all the way around. It's one half of this and one half of this. You can never jump past 0 in this. You never get to 0 unless you start there, in which case you stay there. All right, that's the end of the basic reviews. I'm sorry I didn't get through 9.2. I will do that sometime during the extravaganza coming up over four sessions, details of which will be emailed. See you then.